So it's great to have an enlightened. I know that there's a lot of workplaces that don't do that. So we ran our last set of desktops. I think the last time we renewed our desktops was sometime around 2005. Hardware. Um, one of the things that LTSP does that I love is if it's a good, thin client today, chances are it's still going to be a pretty good, thin client a decade from now. And we literally ran most of these uh, machines uh, for 10 years. And they were still functioning just fine. Uh, the only thing that was causing us uh, an, an issue was we were now getting to the point where everybody wants big monitors, right? And they want to have those. We were still on good old 1280 by 1024 uh, uh, monitors, and of course everybody wants dual monitors, and you know because some people want to get more stuff on screen. We were moving to an electronic application process, um, so they uh, they wanted that sort of stuff. We wanted uh, there was an electronics uh, application process that we wanted to actually capture uh, signatures. So we wanted to have signature pads and those sorts of things. And on our older system that we have, we, we couldn't support that very much. So we went to the board and we said, look, for 15 years, we've saved you $650,000 minus $85,000 times 15. Somebody do the math. It's in the millions uh, worth of money. We would like, we don't want to have to phase this in, right, because we don't want to support you know, some old, some new, right? I mean, anybody who's a systems administrator knows what a pain in the took us that is. So we said, look, we, we, we can refresh in one shot. We can buy everybody new workstations and everybody new monitors for under 100000 And the board bit and said, sure, all right, fine. We'll, we'll let you do it. Uh, so we were, uh, we were given all the money. Uh, to be able to do this, and we looked around, and there was a local uh, ruffian, a businessman um, <laughs> by the name of Ron, who had a, uh, a wonderful product uh, that we settled on because it was the only thin client that we could uh, find uh, that actually supported uh, dual display ports out of the box. Ron, and raise your hand. <laughs> so we ordered, what was it, Ron? All told? 200. Uh, we ordered 200 uh, uh, thin clients from um, uh, from distalsworkstations.com, and Ron delivered them all, and they have all worked flawlessly uh, since we've got them. We haven't had one go bad. Uh, so yeah. So like I say, I mean, this is this is the wonderful thing about open source. Um, it's saving us money. It's building the local economy, right? This is, this is the great thing. We all know what the benefits are. And, and this is the thing that really keeps me geeked about this sort of stuff. Is it's, uh, it's really, really exciting to be able to do these sorts of things. And uh, I think everybody's been, been really, really happy with uh, the way things have, have worked out. So, one of the, one of the issues that we, uh, that we had to uh, determine was whether or not we were going to, before we were running uh, a thin, thin client. So the thin client was basically just a display device and, um, and we were trying to decide whether or not we wanted to keep going down uh, that route or go with a more fat client where we were running the, uh, the desktop on the uh, actual workstation hardware. There's a, a bunch of pros and cons to both methods. Um, for those of us who are in the LTSP development community, there's always a lot of jokes of you know, LTSP where only the clients are thin. Um, and uh, so we had to figure out whether or not we were going to go with fat clients or with like thin clients. So for the fat clients, the pros, if you're actually running the desktop on the thin client, the pro is that we get to take advantage easily of all the local hardware, right? It's just, you see all the USB ports, all the uh, regular local device handling works uh, quite nicely. You're pretty flexible on the desktop uh, of being able to handle a, a lot of different stuff. And, you, and of course, you get the better use of the hardware. Right? If you've got a little bit more powerful thin client, and we certainly had 
more, far more powerful thing than lights than we had before, you can actually offload some of that processing power uh, onto the paper plane itself. The big problem that, of course, you, you have to do is you can't easily see what your individual clients are doing. Obviously, for us, control is, a, is an issue. Um, one of the big problems that we often deal with at Legal Aid Manitoba is uh, what's called the chain of evidence or, or chain of custody uh, type issues. We need to know who's doing what, what potential evidence is where, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have to keep a, a fairly uh, firm line. Actually, one of the biggest advantages that we've had um, within clients, as some of you can imagine, we do have some less than desirable clients who come in and see all this wonderful computer hardware that's in the office. And on several occasions, we have had our clients come back at night and attempt to steal the and have stolen the, uh, the uh, client hardware, thinking that they're really getting something good. Of course, what ends up happening is they walk away with a, a box that won't boot unless it has a server, and the server is behind locked doors, which is fantastic for us because when it comes time for the provincial auditor to wander around and they say, so what data loss incidents do you have? And we get to say, none, even though some hardware went missing. So if somebody walks off with some of our hardware, the worst that we lose is a you know, three or $400 uh, a desktop box and a, you know, a couple hundred dollar monitor. We're not losing, we don't have to go in front of a judge and say, yeah, all of those, all of that evidence of that child porn case, it went missing and it's out there somewhere in the wild. Judges do not take kindly to it. Um, they really want you to hang on yourself. So that works out very well for us. The other uh, advantages, of course, with thin clients is you can see all the processes because everything runs up on the server and you can use thinner desktop hardware. So your desktop hardware is a little cheaper. The cons is it's a little bit harder to do the local devices. Uh, doing the multi-monitor stuff is a little bit more difficult and it doesn't scale quite as well. It, you can certainly hang a whole bunch of thin clients off of one server, but you need a much bigger server. If you pawn off some of that processing power on each one of the thin clients, you don't need quite as big a server. So what we decided to do this time around uh, was to go with the mixed model. Uh, so we're running the desktop on the thin client itself, but our three main applications, uh, which are uh, Firefox, Ice Weasel, uh, and uh, Thunderbird, and Open or Libre Office, are running on the server. Uh, and that allows us to basically take advantage of the power of the server for the larger scale applications. But what we do is the desktop, so we get the, the handling of all the different hardware devices, we get the multi-mode monitor, dual monitors, all that kind of stuff just works out of the box. And it's exactly the same uh, booting up a, uh, a dual monitor box on a thin client as it would be just as easy as if you booted it up on a, a dual monitor full desktop box. So that worked out very, very well for us. So now I'm going to really ignite, and I didn't mince any words. Uh, <laughs> From a humorous point of view, Build 3 sucks hard. Uh, we, <laughs> yep. we, uh, we didn't like, uh, one of the things that really annoyed us uh, about Build 3 is the fact that now you basically need a high-end uh, video card, right? Because you need all those fancy effects. We're running a business. I don't care about transparent windows. I don't care about screensaver or, or desktop switchers that turn into a cube and rotate around, right? I have people who want to word process, want to run a web application and I want to get their email. Right? And now all of a sudden if I'm going to run GNOME 3, they've all got to have high-end NVIDIA video cards uh, in their workstation for what? Uh, so we didn't, we didn't like the idea of GNOME 3. Uh, KDE, well, the big problem with KDE is it takes uh, configurability to an extreme. Um, when you're running a when you're running a, a, a business desktop, right? You want people to be able to have a little bit of fun with their desktop and customize it, but you don't want them to just spend all day diddling around with their <laughs> with with 50 bazillion different icon themes and everything else. So we sort of and plus the big problem was is that from before we've been running GNOME 2 for a long time. Okay. So switching to KDE, right? Everybody's going to sit there and go, oh, it looks different. You know, uh, don't yeah. want to do it. We took a look at FCE, XFCE. We liked it, uh, but it wasn't good old GNOME 2, right? We just liked GNOME 2. Everybody knew it. 
it worked, you could fire it up, you could get it going, and uh, we, we just wanted GNOME 2. That was all we wanted. What about cinnamon? Hmm? What about cinnamon? Uh, cinnamon, we've been so long out of the Windows world that I didn't want... And one of the problems that we had in the very early days um, was we were using... Uh, how many people remember IceWM? Remember that? Yeah. The problem that we had with IceWM was it looks like Windows, it smells like Windows, it kind of tastes like Windows, and it's not Windows. And the problem is, is that people, if it looks like Windows, and it smells like Windows, and it kind of tastes like Windows, people expect it to be Windows, right? And the problem was it wasn't Windows. It would never be Windows. It couldn't be Windows. So people were getting more frustrated with that because they were expecting it to do certain things that it didn't do, that Windows okay. didn't do. So we actually found that by moving to GNOME 2, which we did very early on in our Odyssey, because it looked different, people expected it to be different. And so they didn't come to the table with the same expectations. It was odd. It was really odd. Um, but you just couldn't get people over, no, well, this this you have to single click in and not double click. Or the, you know, whereas if you move to, I'll get to you right, right away, if you, if you get to, uh, you know, something that looks different, then people just say, okay, well, in this, then I must double click. Uh, yes. Also, uh, in terms of resources, RAM usage, KDE uses more than GNOME. GNOME uses more than Cinnamon. Uh, M M Mate uses less than everything. Yeah, that's uh, that was another. Um, LXDE uses less than Mate. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. There's so, there a lot that use less than Mate, but in terms of what he's listed. Right. So for us, of course, I stumbled across a couple of years ago, I stumbled across the Mate project, and it was just fantastic for us. So of course, because of the fact that I've been involved in the open source world for a very, very long time, what's the quickest way to get something you know, implemented that you want? Because they were still sort of in the, they hadn't really released it yet. There were still a lot of bugs. Well, what do you do? You jump in with both feet and you say, oh, I'll help. I'll take this, you know, I'll, I'll start doing some stuff. So um, I jumped in at the, at the 1.6 uh, uh, version, and uh, there were lots and lots of bug fixes that we did. Um, <laughs> one of the things I was saying to Jim last night, that uh, one of the things that we found, there's an awful lot of GNOME 2 code where they'll you know, create an object, and they won't initialize it. And then they'll do, oh, if this happens, then do something with this object. If this happens, then do something with this object. And then later on, they'll use the object in some way. And of course, they've forgotten the fact that, well, maybe neither one of those two things will, will do. There were a lot of bugs that I went and actually fixed um, uh, that were actually long-standing bugs in GNOME that I did just by, instead of saying, you know, G object, blah, you do g object blah equals no at the top of the code, and then the bug went away. So there were a lot of uninitialized variables that, uh, that we fixed. Um, anybody who's ever browsed the uh, the GNOME code knows that there's a lot of comments in there that say fix me, fix me, fix me, fix me. So uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, we sort of rolled up our, our, our sleeve, uh, and we got 1.6 out of the door, and that was when I started uh, working on the upgrade cycle at, uh, at uh, Legal Aid, the 1.8 uh, version has now gone off the door and they're working on 1.10. Um, one of the stated goals of MATE is to try, of course, one of the big problems with uh, the original version of MATE was that it was using GTK2, and of course, GNOME has abandoned GTK2, and distros are desperately, desperately, desperately wanting to stop shipping GTK2 libraries. So we want to switch to GTK3, but we don't want to change what Mate looks like. We want it to look like GNOME 2. So part of what's going on underneath uh, uh, the covers, if you go to the, the Mate project page, you'll see that a lot of work that goes on is actually converting all of the GTK GNOME 2 code to GTK3 without changing the look, without changing the feel, without changing everything. So if you're used to, to 
good old GNOME 2, but you want a modern desktop that's going to use the, the GTK3 uh, goodness, then that's what you want is Mate. And we're, we've deployed Mate uh, all over the province. I'm running it on my, my laptop and it works. It's just great. Um, the other thing that Mate does is, of course, they, they're not trying to be uh, known. So they're not dealing with, you know, things like the, the music player, uh, uh, not, uh, what's, it, what's it called in uh, GNOME, uh, the media player? Oh. Well, yeah, Rhythm, Rhythm Box. Rhythm Box, Box. Rhythm yeah. They're, they're not, you know, we don't have our own version of Rhythm Box, we don't have our own version of this and that and the next thing. No We're stripping. Hmm? No evolution? No, no evolution. No Nautilus? No, no, none of that. <laughs> Well, Nautilus is, is there, that's the, the file manager. So in other words, it's just the bare desktop, and our take on the subject is as well, you can either use the GNOME versions of the programs if you want those, or alternatively, you can use whatever version you want, you know, kind of agnostic. So uh, we went with, uh, with uh, Mate, and very, very happy with it. So anybody who remembers fondly the GNOME 2 days and just wishes that GNOME 2 would go back, I highly recommend you to go to matedesktop.org and check them out. Uh, in the Debian distributions, Mate has become uh, a first rate. It is uh, the latest uh, version of Debian Jesse. It's just a package that you install. App, get install Mate Desktop and uh, you, get the whole, uh, you get the whole good thing. Um, I believe also, there's also an Ubuntu, uh, isn't there an Ubuntu role? Of, of there's Ubuntu an Mate? official release of uh, Ubuntu Mate. Yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, and there's actually quite a number, um, for those of you who are in, sort of cognizant of no, the GNOME no community, there's a lot of people who are actually switching back to Mate and saying, yeah, we just, we just want an old GNOME 2 back, so we're quite happy with it. One of the problems that, we, that we've run into, of course, so to launch the uh, remote uh, applications, we've rolled some uh, custom.desktop files that basically uh, just do an SSH to the server and, and launch the application up there. Um, these are the absolutely pathological file names that we get in evidence from the Crown. So we get things with spaces, with brackets, with pound sizes, with square brackets. But, uh, I, I didn't. I wasn't able to find quickly one that had an ampersand in them, but we get those. Right. Single and double quotes. And single. Oh yeah, you get single and double quotes. Like they'll put apostrophe s in there and all kinds of wonderful yeah. stuff. Well, as anybody who's ever tried to launch a program over SSH knows, doing all the fancy quoting can get to be a little bit odd. And of course, when you start missing, when you start mixing. Uh, comment signs and yeah. uh, and ampersands and everything else in there it just becomes a mess and you get all kinds of and try to explain to your users to well you know just take these files and rename them and then it'll all be all right your users don't get that right? what they know is they just got you know a piece of evidence from the ground they just want to double click on it they just want it to work mm -hmm. so what did we end up doing well what we ended up doing uh, oddly enough uh, was a simple little solution uh, what we actually do is we do SSH server remote, and I've got a, the, the next little program that I'll show you remote. And then what we do is we just run through the art list and base 64 encode all the arguments. So that you're actually sending down a real big ugly string. But it's a real big ugly string with no spaces, no pound signs, no ampersands, no nothing. And it goes through SSH just fine. Uh, and then the same thing on the server side. Uh, we're basically setting up uh, uh, some of the display, pulse server, uh, the eSpeaker environment variables, and then we just URL save base64 decode all the arguments. And when we launch the subprocess.call, shell equals false. So that has solved all of our problems. We don't have to worry about any quoting things anymore that works very, very well. Uh, and we're actually, one of the things that uh, we've got our LTSP. Um, about our LTSP uh, uh, hackathon uh, coming up, LTSP BTS by the C, and uh, I'll be probably talking with uh, some of the other developers, and we'll look and see if we can roll this into the, uh, the main code because I know that we do have some problems sometimes with that. So this works quite well for us. Uh, we use um, KVM for a lot of our uh, virtualization. Uh, another big thing 
once again, the, uh, the cost savings. We were using VMware before, <coughs> and uh, we implemented uh, KVM across our, uh, across our organization for doing some of the virtualization stuff. The LTSB servers tend to run bare metal, uh, but we do uh, run most of the other uh, services that we do. And we run, we run pretty much a complete suite. So we run our own mail server. Uh, we run our own, uh, in fact, um, every once in a while, they keep coming up. The board keeps coming up. Well, well, you know, we keep hearing about this cloud stuff, you know, kind of a thing. You know, what are you guys going to get on the cloud and save even more money? We keep having to explain to the board that, yeah, if, if a judge wants to know where these this particular piece of electronic evidence uh, is, you can't just sort of stand up in front, in front of the judge and go, it's on the cloud. Uh, that the judge wants to know precisely where it is. And, and there have been times in the past when we have had to say, this piece of evidence is on this hard drive, on this server, in this location, etc., etc., and this is where the stuff is. So we have to, we are our own entity. We can't mix with anything else. We can't outsource anything because we can't guarantee that a piece of evidence <coughs> won't end up uh, on that, uh, on some external entity. So, uh, we have our we have a uh, we had a VMware farm uh, before with uh, two or three servers, and we switched that over to KVM, and that saved us about 12k a year. So we're pretty good. Uh, the big thing that we've started up recently, um, we wanted a um, uh, a paperless application process for a couple of different reasons, or a few different reasons. Um, one of the big problems, of course, that we face, as you can all imagine, is privacy. Um, we have uh, some of the worst data that you could possibly imagine. Um, we have, um, in our file rooms, we have autopsy photos. We have uh, you know, child porn evidence. We have there's all kinds of very, very nasty stuff that we have to absolutely take very good care of. This cannot fall into anybody's hands. It cannot, not only into the general public's hands, but we don't want it falling into the prosecution's hands, right? Because there may be a piece of evidence that exonerates a, a, a particular uh, a client or something like that. So we have to keep that stuff very, 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 very tight. Every paper that we don't generate is a paper that we don't have to store. It's a piece of paper that we don't have to monitor. It's a piece of paper that we don't have to keep an eye on. Uh, unfortunately, uh, how many people here are sort of familiar, have ever done anything with the legal industry? One. Uh, one or two, there we go. Um, as, as you know, the legal industry lives and dies by paper, right? Lawyers want to see everything on the paper. Um, so there's, uh, this is a fairly big sea change for us uh, in trying to go paperless. And there is some, obviously, some resistance from uh, the lawyers. We get these very, very large PDF disclosure things from the Crown, um, which is our equivalent of the, the state, I guess, would be down here. We call it the Crown, because we've still got the Queen. Um, but uh, we get these large, several thousand page disclosures. And of course, the first thing the lawyers, they need three pages out of it. So what they want to do is print out the entire several thousand page uh, document so they can extract the three pages that they need. So trying to get them to say, no, why don't you just print the three pages that you need? You can go to the print dialog box and just, <laughs> just print the three pages. So that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing. Um, but a piece of paper that we never generate in the first place is a piece of paper that we don't have to, to deal with. So um, what we wanted to do was to electronically capture uh, the, uh, the signatures. Uh, from Because, of course, as people come in, they're going to fill out a legal aid application, and then they're going to sign. Well, uh, I brought one along uh, just to show you what we're using. We're using the, the, the Topaz uh, series of pads. So these are what we're using to actually, these are what we're using to uh, actually collect the, the signatures. And we were able to actually get these working fairly easily uh, on the thin clients with the, uh, with the desktop technology. Topaz actually provides uh, some Linux drivers are one of the few Linux, or one of the few signature pad technologies I think that does uh, actually provide Linux drivers. And what we're actually running is on the individual workstations, we run uh, um, Tomcat. 
and we have a little bit of uh, code in the uh, in the Tomcat startup that we've put that basically just does a USB check and sees whether or not the um, uh, the USB pad is actually plugged in, and if it is, it starts up the Tomcat driver. So uh, it's got uh, both i386 and AMD64 libraries. It's got a Java interface, and we actually download the uh, uh, the signature from the local workstation and to essentially talk to the signature pad, uh, the Topaz's uh, web file actually allows you to just make local web calls. So you can set up the tablet, so the tablet state equals one, turns the tablet on, capture mode, start capturing the signature, your two image sizes, and then just grab the, uh, grab the image. The person signs, and you get an image into the browser, and then that mm -hmm. gets uploaded into our application. And what we do, uh, because of the fact that we're actually having to capture the signature on the local workstation for the intake offices that are actually dealing with the general public, they don't run, in that case, they don't run the web browser on the server. There they're running the web browser locally on the local workstation. So the web browser has access to both the signature pad and our, our server application. So, and our, we've got enough, uh, each one of our uh, workstation says, what, we got four gigs, I think it was wrong? Yes. Per workstation? Yeah. So uh, we've got four gigs per workstation. So we've got enough memory to be able to run that. It works very, very well. So that's another fantastic way that we've been able to, you know, leverage some open technologies and allow us to uh, basically cut down 